This is Dennis McMahon, and welcome to Positively Vermont. And today my guest is Meredith Angwin, uh, who is a scientist and an expert uh, in her field, uh, and author of a book called Shorting the Grid, The Hidden Fragility of Our Electric Grid. And we just spoke with uh, Meredith back, believe it or not, a year and a half ago, about this very important and very readable book and some of the issues facing the state, the region, and the country about our electric supply. Uh, but first of all, uh, Meredith, would you just give uh, our listeners and, and viewers uh, a little bit about, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your background, and what you've been doing? Sure. Um, well, I'm, I, uh, I have a chemistry degree, a master's in chemistry, and uh, I worked most of my life in the utility industry in research to help make power plants uh, less polluting and more reliable. In other words, I did corrosion research and pollution control research. And I was one of the first women to be a project manager at the Electric Power Research Institute, which is a consortium of utilities that uh, does projects together so that like if you're a little utility out in you know a little rural cooperative uh, and you're a member of EPRI you can still get the benefit of expensive uh, research projects because you don't have to fund it all yourself and of course a lot of the issues that face a utility are common to other utilities. So, uh, you know, the same kind of equipment, the same kind of problems and so forth. So anyway, uh, after I was at EPRI, I ran a consulting firm in corrosion control and stuff. And then after that, uh, later on, I retired and our kids were living on the East Coast and EPRI was, uh, EPRI is Electric Power Research Institute, was in California. So we moved here to be closer to the kids and the grandkids. So we have, uh, two kids and four grandkids. So anyway, um, that's where I moved here. And then when I got here, you know, I've been in energy all my life. So I joined our town's energy committee for a couple of years. And I was also, I'm also very much in favor of nuclear energy. So I started a blog uh, in favor of Vermont Yankee, because when I read the newspapers, they really I felt that they were very slanted against Vermont Yankee. And they didn't give, uh, give it very as much space in the newspaper is it deserved. They gave a lot of space to people saying it should shut down, but they didn't give much space about the plant itself. So at any rate, I began a blog about it. Well, one of the things about this blog was that the plant had interactions with the grid operator. Now, this was not my expertise at that point. This is, uh, we're looking at uh, uh, 2010 here. But I said, well, I got to figure this out. So I would do research and I would write a blog post about the plant and the grid. And, it, and of course, when you write a blog, people are following you who you don't know who they are. And one of the people who was following me was the man who was very involved with, uh, with the uh, grid, grid governance. And he said, Meredith, you're writing about the grid. Have you thought of joining the consumer liaison group of the grid operator? And I said, oh. Who knew it had a consumer liaison group? So at any rate, I I I, I joined it, and uh, then I was on the coordinating committee for four years in that group, and that's where I really learned about the grid. You see, before that, I'm a chemist. I worked on materials problems, okay, and I really didn't work on governance problems and so forth. But when I joined that group, I began to see that there were no mechanisms in place in our grid for reliability. Oh, they will tell you their mechanisms. They will say, oh, we, we search for reliability. But you begin, oh, we, we are responsible for reliability. So you look at uh, North, uh, the Nor Northern National Energy Re Electricity Reliability Council, NERC, and you say, what do you do about reliability? And uh, they say, oh, we do lots of things. We train people. We have rules for how you have to run a substation. We, I said, well, what if a uh, area doesn't have enough um, power plants for reliability? Say, oh, that's not our issue. So then you go over to FERC or, or to ISO New England. You say, what if an area doesn't have enough power plants for 
for an area. That's not our issue. That's resource adequacy. We don't cover resource adequacy. The states cover resource adequacy. So you see that, well, there's no place where you can say, you didn't have enough power plants online, and that's why you had to do blackouts. There's no place you can stay, and it's your fault because it's everybody's fault. That everybody has some little pieces of pie and a way to pass the buck. And I got very, very upset about this. Uh, I mean, you know, I said, look, and I began talking to my friends about it. Of course, that's what I do. And I found that I would have to give these long winter talks about the grid and how it was run, because it's a very complicated layer of band-aid after band-aid to keep it going. That's the only way to describe it. Uh, nobody, nobody, the buck doesn't stop on anybody's desk, but people have been adding new rules and new rules and new rules in the hope that some of these rules will help. And of course, the new rules just mean that there's another set of new rules later to fix those rules. So I found that I couldn't even explain it to people. It was really, really annoying. And uh, I realized that it's just not something you can explain in two blog posts or uh, a 10 minute talk. So I decided it really needed a book. And I went around looking for other books that covered this subject and, and they really didn't. I'm sorry to say they really didn't. There were excellent books on the history of the grid, you know, starting with uh, Thomas Edison and Tesla and, and rural electric cooperatives and all this. But, but, but when you got down to how a grid is governed right now, it was very, very empty space. <laughs> and so uh, I ended up uh, writing this book and it was published in October uh, 2020. And uh, it had, a, you know, people read it and they liked it. But uh, what happened then, and, and I think this gets into more than the book, it gets into what happened since the book was, what happened then was that Texas had those huge blackouts mm -hmm. in February, 2021. And I got emails from people saying, because I'd read your book, I could understand how how it, how it happened in Texas, what the sequence was in Texas. And I said, oh, that's good. <laughs> I wrote the book. And all of a sudden, you know, there were people who wanted me to be on podcasts, people I hadn't heard of. I mean, you had asked me to be in a podcast earlier, but you, you're in Vermont, I'm in Vermont. I mean, it made sense, but all of a sudden it was like, you know, all kinds of people. And the reason is that, as I said, there was a blank space where understanding how the grid was organized was, and this book filled a, a, a big part of it, not all of it. It can't fill all of it. You would need a, a, a thousand page book. This is 400 pages and you would need a thousand page book. And, and anyway, I, I want to say one more thing before we go on with this. And that is, of course, I had Al readers who read it while I was in the process of writing it. And what they all said was, you need a glossary. <laughs> And I did. I absolutely needed a glossary. And the, I, I think I'm as proud of the glossary in this book that explains all the infinite acronyms that are used on the grid uh, as much as anything else. Because if all you had in the book was the glossary, you would at least be able to get a clue about the headlines. Well, I have to tell you, um, this is like cramming for an exam. Uh, I read this book. Uh, the night before our interview in December 2020. And not only was, did, it, did it go fast and I had the time to make all kinds of interlineations, but I found it very readable. And uh, for someone not in the field, uh, it, it was uh, uh, very informative and uh, it, it's really a great job. And uh, the rest is kind of history. Uh, since that time, uh, there's a lot of meat in here about the problems, the issues, the solutions, uh, just give us a, a, a rendition of, of what has happened in your field and maybe uh, with uh, the book since uh, we first discussed it. Well, let's say that um, when the book first came out, some of the people who, two, two people in particular who worked in, 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 in grid issues, uh, claimed I was being alarmist or, or whatever. And oddly enough, they retracted that somewhere after Texas. <laughs> 
<laughs> and 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 so I would say that what has happened since then is that the issues on the grid, the nobody having true responsibility for reliability, um, have really come home to roost. And one of the things uh, in my book is uh, I have a section based on uh, a presentation that James Bryan of Energy Tariff Experts gave to the Consumer Liaison Group when I was a member of it. And you can find the presentation on the web. So, you know, it's referenceable. But um, one of the things he noticed was that, yes, the price of natural gas had gone down, but the price of electricity had not followed it down. And, and, and what he, he said is that we've gotten away. Well, he didn't put it, we've gotten away. We have added many things like uh, uh, paying for renewable energy credits and all kinds of things to a consumer's bill, but it hasn't come back to punch us. Well, he didn't put it that way, that's me. Anyway, this is my rephrasing. It hasn't come back to punch us because the natural gas prices are low, but we have used up all the leeway that those low natural gas prices uh, have given us. And when natural gas prices go up, it's going to be uh, the, the consumers are going to really be, uh, you know, hit by it. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and that's sort of what's happening now. Uh, uh, natural gas prices have gone up. Uh, there's a uh, a shortage of natural gas sort of worldwide uh, and um, electricity prices have, have, have followed them up because we have used up our, our leeway we've used <laughs> by investing in, 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 in other things that don't add to the reliability of the grid. Uh, I'm going to say another thing about the grid. I, 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 when I wrote the book, if you remember at the beginning of the book, uh, or you're supposed to have memorized it, you understand. Uh, <laughs> I describe two grids. I say there's a, a physical grid, which consists of uh, wires and, and substations and a control room, which keeps the grid completely in balance. And then there's a, a policy grid. And the policy grid is about how power plants get paid, but it comes from big policy decisions, like, for example, um, that uh, renewable plants um, get, uh, can get renewable energy credits, which pay them separately from whatever money they get on the grid. So you will have a bill and it may say there's only this portion of the bill is the energy portion and this portion is distribution. But that isn't quite fair because what's going on is that the distribution part also includes what your distribution utility is paying for renewable energy credits. So to some extent, your distribution charges include hidden costs for the renewables costs. And, and so the, the, that's what I mean by I ended up having to, to write a book about it because, uh, you know, this is, this is not, uh, you know, then somebody's going to say, well, why do they have these renewable energy? Well, there's a new renewable portfolio standard or anyway, it, 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 it gets to be a fairly uh, complex uh, situation. And, uh, and I, I also wanted to say that since I wrote the book, I realized that people don't know much about the power grid, the actual physical grid, but they know, they know even less about the policy grid, except for some vague ideas that we're encouraging renewable and exactly how that works in terms of their bills or in terms of percentage energy costs to other costs or whatever, and, and, and so forth. So there's a lot of, I wrote the book partially to help people understand these things and to be able to make their own conclusions based on, on the facts. But um, since then, I've come up with an idea for there's a third grid. And you, said, you understand there's only one grid out there with 
wires. I, mm -hmm. I'm not imagining there are three grids out there with wires, but there's the grid out there with wires. So the grid of how power plants get paid and what policy decisions are made. And then there's the grid everybody knows about, which I call the could grid. And that's what you read about in the paper. We could have batteries. We don't have them yet, but we could. We could have transmission lines that, that run all the way across the country. We could have a unified grid all over the country. We could have 100% renewables. We could, you know, there's a breakthrough in batteries. No, there isn't. Yes, there is. You know, everybody is following the could grid. And the trouble is that some of those things can happen. Some of those things can happen in the future, but the future is based on the past. And you have to know what's happening now to have an idea of how, how or whether it can transition to this could grid. So anyway, I've, I've been really concerned about the fact that the could grid is the one everybody knows about. And the could grid uh, basically uh, can include nuclear if, if we had planned for it. Uh, I, I think, and I follow what's going on in uh, Britain right now, that uh, Britain has taken the initiative of having many nuclear power plants. And, and that's extremely serious, possibly with an older uh, infrastructure than ours, but they're going at it. They're working well, on they it. They are, absolutely. And a lot of places in Europe sort of, uh, especially in Europe, sort of woke up because they said, uh, wait a minute, we can't count on, on, on natural gas from Russia. And even if we can't count on it, we're paying Russia the money to invade Ukraine. <laughs> we don't like this. So they really want energy independence, energy security in a way that uh, 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 two years ago, people were in this sort of uh, happy, world of it's all globalized and and everybody's agreeing and so forth and so on and uh there was always a problem with that viewpoint even before uh the ukrainian invasion of ukraine and that is okay we're not at war with with Canada, and we're unlikely to go to war with Canada. Nevertheless, Canada, like any sovereign country, takes care of its own people first, which means that when we have a very bad cold snap here, Canada lowers the amount of, ex of, of energy it exports to us. It took me a long time to try and figure this out. I, at first, I noticed it, and then I read a, 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 a a footnote on, on one of the winter reliability reports from our grid operator, which said that Canada only took on a supply obligation for about half the amount of electricity, Quebec that is, I, not the all of Canada. Yeah. Quebec only took on a supply obligation for about half the electricity that it usually supplies us, which means that if, in, if there's a cold snap, it could cut to half the amount it was exporting and it wasn't breaking any of the rules that it signed up for. And so when people begin saying, oh, well, you know, in a cold snap, we can count on Canada, I'm like, uh, have you been looking at what goes on? I mean, no, Canada will, Quebec will take care of the people in Quebec first, and they should. Um, they're not in the charity business to help out New England while people in Quebec can't get enough heat. Well, actually, uh, this uh, show is being recorded on May 26th. And what motivated me to uh, do a, a follow up and not realizing it, it's been a year and a half was the power situation in Quebec uh, over the past the weekend uh, and in Ontario uh, because of storms and, and uh, uh, weather conditions, uh, power outages, of hundreds of thousands of people uh, in that province alone. Yes, yes. And, and could that happen here? I'm just curious. About well, the answer is that my book is mostly about resource, what you would call resource adequacy. Are there enough power lines? Are there enough transmission lines? What happened in Quebec and was, was huge storms. And uh, yes, of course that could happen here. I mean, storms can happen in Quebec, they can happen in, in New England, uh, they can happen in the Gulf states. Uh, storms are a hazard 
Um, the the question for, for, for me is, uh, how quickly can you get back up after a storm? That depends on having enough power to put on the lines. And that is the concern that I spent most of the book on. But, but, but another thing that's worth saying about this is that, do you think Quebec was exporting to us when all those storms were hitting? No. So you can't really count on your neighbors to save you. They're going to solve their problems first, and they should. Well, what, what uh, do you see now uh, are potential solutions? What, what can we in Vermont do? What can we do in the region? What can we do in other parts of, uh, of the country? Uh, to uh, uh, deal with this, the hidden fragility of the electric grid. What can we do to compensate uh, in well, the near future? I think the first thing to do is to stop shutting down nuclear plants, okay? Because nuclear plants are very, very steady and they are a kind of a backstop for the rest of the grid. Uh, and um, there's going to be somebody who's going to write you and say, no, no, nuclear plants are baseload and we don't need baseload anymore. Well, actually, I've been just seeing some studies of New York State and New York State includes New York City and includes some very, very rural areas. OK, all those areas, New York City and the rural areas, 60 percent of the electricity which is used is electricity that is used 24 hours a day, 60 to 70%. So if we had base load of nuclear for 60 to 70%, we would have a far less dangerous situation with, with whether we could meet load, okay? So the first thing is not to, to, to uh, uh, shut down nuclear plants. The second thing would be to understand that perfection is not possible. So let's say that you say, um, we want very clean electricity, so we're only gonna allow nuclear and natural gas. Well, natural gas is delivered just in time and things can interrupt it. Things from, things such as a pipeline compressor having a problem. Uh, another thing would be, uh, that um, it's a cold snap and houses are using a lot of natural gas to heat. Utilities that supply gas to houses make what's called firm contracts with natural gas because they don't want to leave their customers in the lurch. Utilities that burn natural gas to make electricity, that is electric utility, electric power plants, they generally make interruptible contracts with natural gas because first of all, it's cheaper. And secondly, they know that the uh, utility uh, will, um, will not, uh, the, the, net, the power plant will, will can go offline if it wants to, unlike a house, okay? A house doesn't want to just, okay, I, I'll, go, I'll be going cold now, whatever. But a power plant could go offline because they're merchant plants and they make money when they sell power. But if they can't get the gas, they go offline. So that is a really important, uh, important thing. So uh, anyhow, I just thought I'd, I'd, I'd put that out there uh, about uh, natural gas being a kind of a dangerous thing to rely on. So... What we need is allowing oil to be stored on site. Now, our grid operator made a winter reliability program encouraging power plants to store oil on site by subsidizing the oil on site. But then, uh, then you know, uh, advocates of 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 of, of you know that we're we're, we're gonna. Uh, We've got to do absolutely everything in our power to, to stop global warming. We're like, no, not oil. You're not allowed to burn oil. Well, you have to burn oil because otherwise you're going to get, have a, a, a real problem with, with power plants not being able to make power. So I, I just feel like you can be against 
this or against that, but, but think about what, how it will affect people. When Texas had its blackout, people died. I mean, that's really important to remember, at least in my opinion. I'll tell you, um, we we're, we're actually uh, have a, only a minute or so left, uh, and, and this has really been, been fascinating. And uh, uh, what, what you suggested as a title uh, today, uh, which we're going to use, is The Fragile Grid Comes Home. Uh, and if you could just uh, uh, tell us uh, what you predict or what should be done in the, in the next time, uh, and we're going to try to get you back as this picture develops over the course of time. Uh, what, what do you feel is, is the next step? Well, the next step is to be uh, honor our reliable power plants, um, both the nuclear plants and dual fire gas plants that can store oil on site and not just keep hampering them and hampering them and thinking it's all going to be okay because it won't be okay. And uh, what's happening right now is the NERC, the NERC, Reliability, reliability, federal Reliability, Electric Reliability Council uh, is, uh, has been predicting that this summer, the chances of rolling blackouts in the Midwest are, are high. So you see, we had rolling, black, we had rolling blackouts in, in Texas, which actually couldn't roll because they had so much trouble that they ended up with, instead of a one hour blackout and then it goes to a different area, they ended up blacking out people for 40 hours. And we came very close to rolling blackouts on our own grid, which I wrote about in my book. And now NERC, for the first time I've ever seen it, is predicting a high probability of rolling blackouts in the upper Midwest. And so what I'm saying is we have become too dependent on just-in-time natural gas. We have been scornful of plants that, like nuclear plants, that keep uh, fuel on site. A nuclear plant start, has 18 months of fuel on site. And we have got to get back to encouraging, keeping the nuclear plants that keep fuel on site, not being uh, keeping power plants that have fuels we don't like, like oil or coal, available for the cold weather. And I, I mean, it, we really have to take the reliability of the grid seriously. That's what it has, has to be. Once we begin to realize the reliable grid is uh, the basis of, modern health and safety, then we will be, make, make some decisions that are reasonable. Uh, the decisions can be for low carbon grids. Nuclear is low carbon and so forth, but they can't be like, we've got to be 100% low carbon, whatever happens to the people around here. So that's, I guess, that, is that a help? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it sounds like a flexible approach, but people have to study this. I think this book is, is really a, a great primer on, on what needs to be done or what, what has gone wrong. But for the future, uh, it's certainly a, a starting point. I Thank you very much. That's what I really felt obliged to write it because I felt that I was finding out things that affected everybody's life and, and I couldn't explain it to people in a short manner. And I tried to write it so that it was a, at a really readable level. Well, it certainly you know, is. <laughs> and what we're going to be doing is uh, we'll be following this because it's in the news every day. There's news out of Canada this morning. There's all kinds of things going on. And of course, we have the war and we have the whole issue of, of the supply uh, and, and, uh, and Russia and all that. So we will be following this up and we will be in touch. And uh, hopefully uh, uh, we might have a, a better power picture uh, in the near future. Thanks to people like you who are uh, keeping us aware. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I just want to uh, note that uh, this is Dennis McMahon, and this has been Positively Vermont. My guest has been Meredith Angwin of Vermont, uh, the author of Shorting the Grid, The Hidden Fragility of Our Electric Grid. And our topic today has been uh, The Fragile Grid Comes Home. Uh, thank you for watching. Thank you.